All right, uh, so we're in chapter, I think, seven here, uh, talking about energy. And uh, remember, in terms of energy, the major sort of units that we commonly come across are joules or kilojoules, or there are calories or kilocalories, which are two very common units of energy. Most of the time we deal with joules and kilojoules, but uh, calories does pop up occasionally. The relationship between those two is one calorie, I believe is 4.184 joules. So that is a conversion factor that's used a lot in terms of energy. Uh, remember that as we talked about, uh, heat does flow from hot to cold. And we talked about a couple of different ways to uh, look at energy, uh, we talked about exothermic sort of processes and a reminder that exothermic means that heat or energy is released. And usually when we calculate some type of energy value that is exothermic, uh, that value usually ends up being a negative value. While we have endothermic processes and endothermic processes are processes where heat and energy is absorbed. Energy. And when we calculate those type of processes, uh, that is a positive value for energy. Uh, we talked about also energy diagrams. And when we talk about energy diagrams, a uh, reminder that uh, if it is a situation such as this, where this is your reactants, this is your products, and your reactants are higher in energy than your products, overall energy has to be given off. Uh, and that is going to be an exothermic type of diagram, as opposed to when we look at one where our reactants are actually lower in energy than our products. So in order to sort of get up there to the products, uh, energy has to be put in. And this is an endothermic uh, type of diagram. And remember as well that the energy heel here is the activation energy. And that is the minimum amount of energy that's required for a reaction to occur. Remember that not all collisions will result uh, in products being formed. They have to actually hit each other in sort of the right location. They also have to hit each other with the right amount of energy for that reaction to occur. And we also talked about the very peak of this hill here is what is referred to as a transition state. And that is usually where you have a transition state complex, which has you know partially broken bonds, partially made bonds, uh, something that's really transitioning from reactants to products. In order to do that, again, um, you pretty much have to break all your bonds on your reactant side recombine there on your product side. One very common way that we look at uh, energy in a reaction is what is known as the enthalpy, the delta H, which is the change in enthalpy. And this is really like the heat of a reaction. And as we talked about energy and enthalpy, uh, they are what are referred to as state functions. And state functions basically only depend really on two important aspects, which is where you start and where you end. So uh, when we think about a chemical reaction, uh, where we start our reactants and where we end our products. So to calculate something like the change in enthalpy, uh, you basically take the change in enthalpy of all the products minus the change in enthalpy of all the reactants. And again, uh, these would be values that you would look up on a table. These are delta H of formation uh, type of values. And uh, you wanna also, as we talked about, make sure that you multiply by the coefficient in the balance equation when you do this. So if you had something like 2A plus B goes to 3C, uh, we would take three times the value of the delta H for C minus two times the value of the delta H for A plus uh, basically the delta H for B in this case. So um, it's important to also take those coefficients into account. The other important thing is to make sure that when you look up on that table, you do find uh, the substance in the correct phase. 
uh, not just grab the first one. Water is a very common mistake. Again, uh, make sure you do get it in sort of the right base. Also, things that are in their standard state, uh, uncombined, like metals or oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine gas, those type of things, uh, they will typically have a delta H value of zero. So those would typically be zeros when you find in the table. Uh, you basically add up all your products minus all your reactants, and that gives you your delta H for the reaction. And once again, if the delta H value is negative here, it will be exothermic. If it is positive, it will be endothermic. And if you look on your graph, that really is the difference between the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products here. So because the products in this case are lower in energy than the reactants, basically have a smaller number minus a larger number, that gives you a negative number for delta H, which is why it will be exothermic. And here, the delta H of this reaction, again, would be the energy difference between the products and the reactants in this case. And in this case, the products are, again, higher in energy than the reactants, which means you have a larger number minus a smaller number, which will give you a positive number there for endothermic. We finished up, I think, talking about specific heat, which is another way that we could sort of calculate the energy associated with a reaction. Uh, the specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And the specific heat, for example, of liquid water is uh, 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius or one calorie per gram, so that one, per gram per degree Celsius. And that is basically the definition of specific heat capacity is those units, the amount of energy required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius is basically what the definition there of specific heat is. Um, <clears throat> there is a specific heat equation, uh, which we also saw, uh, which is Q is equal to MS delta T is the version we used. Q here is heat or energy. And it typically has units of either joules or calories. M is mass, which has units of grams. S is our specific heat capacity, which has units, as we just saw there, joules per gram per degree Celsius, or calories per gram per degree Celsius. And the most important guy here really is in these sort of calculations, the change in temperature. You always want to do final minus initials so that that will give you either a negative sign or not a negative sign, depending on the situation. Uh, so this should be final temperature minus the initial temperature. Also in chemistry, probably one of the few places where it is usually left in degree Celsius. Uh, that's because of specific heat capacities that we usually use uh, has a temperature in degree Celsius. So uh, we actually do actually leave it here in degree Celsius. As we talked about, pretty much uh, mass will be a positive number. Specific heat capacity will be a positive number, which means really the only place a negative could come from is that change in temperature. So if you end up with a temperature that is uh, less than your initial temperature, like you had a piece of metal that was 90 degrees and ended up at 25 degrees, uh, when you do the difference there, 25 minus 90, that's gonna give you again that negative number, uh, which will turn our Q into a negative number and vice versa. If somebody gains energy, uh, their final temperature will be higher than their initial temperature um, as a result of gaining all that energy. So when you take your final minus initial, you'll end up with a positive number. So Q works the same way as delta H in terms of exothermic or endothermic, negative value of Q, exothermic process, energy being given off, uh, positive value of Q, endothermic process, uh, basically energy being absorbed. Uh, truth be told, if you do Q under uh, constant pressure conditions, which is in most cases how you probably would do it, uh, that basically will give you the delta H for that particular reaction. So they're sort of equal to each other under constant pressure conditions, which as we'll do an experiment, probably I guess it's next week, maybe. Um, you could do this experiment very simply, which is a thermometer, basically a couple of coffee cups and some water, basically following the change in the temperature of water. You can figure out either how much uh, energy water absorbed in that reaction, which would mean that's how much energy was released by somebody else, 
or you could uh, basically observe how much energy was released by the water, which means somebody else gained that energy. Remember when we talk about energy sort of being transferred, it is sort of like a perfect transfer. So however much energy somebody loses, somebody else has to gain basically that exact same amount of energy. Uh, so that's the law of conservation of energy, right? We don't lose any along the way. It definitely is transferred uh, to different places. Any questions on any of that stuff there? <clears throat> okay. And I remember what we did. Uh, we did a couple of specific heat questions, uh, but there's also that idea of uh, transferring energy from one object to the next that are different temperatures. So for example, if we, if we had say uh, some water here, let's just say we had 110 grams of water, H2O. We'll say my initial temperature of my water was uh, 25 degrees Celsius. And let's say I had a piece of metal over here. And let's just say I had 75 grams of this metal. And let's say that I took this metal and I heated it up really hot. We'll go with 95 degrees Celsius. So we have a pretty hot piece of metal there. And in this case, if I took this metal and put it into my water, in this case, what is going to happen to the temperature of the metal? Will it go up or will it go down in this case? It should go down, right? He's going to transfer from the hotter object to the colder object. So the metal is going to go down. Temperature of the water is going to go up, right? So let's just say we did that and we saw that the final temperature of the water was at 29 degrees, why not? <clears throat> now I have this piece of metal that basically is sitting in this water. That final temperature of the metal should also come to rest at what temperature? Should also come to rest at 29 degrees Celsius because pretty much is taking a nice swim in the water, right? So at some point the metal will equilibrate with the temperature of the water. So in this situation, by knowing the final temperature of the water in this case, uh, we also will know the final temperature of our metal, which would be 29 degrees Celsius. So in this situation, uh, we could actually use water to help us understand how much energy was, for example, released by the metal. We could also use the water here to help us figure out also uh, basically um, the specific heat capacity of the metal. So let's just say we wanted to know what is the specific heat capacity of the metal here? So when we look at water, we have pretty much all the information that we would need for water to go into our specific heat equation. That's because we know liquid water specific heat is 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So if we put in our values here for our water that I made up and we'll hope for the best here if they made up numbers. Uh, we'll put our 4.184, which again is the specific heat capacity of liquid water. Our final temperature in this case is 29 minus our initial, which is 25 degrees Celsius. And if we do all this good stuff here, we got 110 times 4.184 uh, times basically 29 minus 25, which is like four. We'll end up with something like 1,841 joules of energy. Truthfully, it's about 1,800 with some sig figs, but we won't go too far into sig figs at this point. But that energy is a positive number, right, at 1,800 joules as well, which means in terms of the water, this process is exothermic or endothermic. It is endothermic as we would expect as the heat is being transferred from the metal to the water and the water is picking up all that heat and absorbing it. So that is why, again, we end up here with a positive value. So now we want to figure out, for example, the specific heat capacity there of the metal. And there is a relationship in this case that the Q of the water should equal minus Q of the metal which means if the water picked up 1800 joules of energy, the metal should have released 1800 joules of energy. The difference though for the metal, it is a exothermic process. 
which means the metal should actually have a negative value for its Q. So if we put that in there, that would then give us that the Q of the metal should be negative 1800 joules as the metal is basically given away that much energy. Any questions on that? <clears throat> now, if we look at the metal and we think about our Q of our metal in this case, it is MS delta T. We now have Q of the metal. We have the mass of the metal. We have the change in temperature of the metal. We could actually solve for the specific heat capacity here by solving for S. S would equal Q of the metal divided by M times delta T in this case. Putting in our values here, that would be minus 1800 joules divided by the mass of the metal, which was 75 grams. Important here, again, that we do final minus initial temperature for the metal, which means my final temperature here for the metal is 29 degrees Celsius. My initial temperature was the hotter piece of metal as it cooled down as it went for a swim there. That's important because that's going to give me what type of number on the bottom. Give me a negative number on the bottom that goes with the negative on top, which will turn my specific heat capacity into a positive number, which is what it should be in this case. So if we do that, 1800 uh, divided by 75, divided by my made up number, let's see how bad I did. We will end up uh, with a specific heat capacity for the metal, zero point, we'll call it 37. None of the units here cancel, so they all still remain, which is good because that is the units of specific heat capacity, joules per gram per degree Celsius. Not too bad by making up numbers, so that worked pretty good. Now this experiment, again, can be done very simply with, and you'll do it when we do it, that experiment, basically two coffee cups, which is a pretty nice insulator. You have your water inside, you have a lid where you can put a thermometer in there and basically just open the lid, put the metal in and follow really the temperature change of water. And by really figuring out how the water either absorbs or releases energy, you could relate it back to whatever reaction is happening. You could do this with a piece of metal into water, you could do this with an actual just reaction, solutions together. We could do it with solutions together where it does an actual chemical reaction in a cup because solutions are aqueous, right? And aqueous pretty much means water. And we could still use the specific heat capacity of water even if it's like two solutions together because they're aqueous. So it's a really simple way to figure out how much energy is happening. And again, this is what we sometimes refer to as calorimetry. And um, coffee cup calorimetry because you typically use uh, nice insulated coffee cups to do these things. Um, but this is a very simple way to figure out how much energy. And like I said, if you do this under constant pressure, which is usually the case in a lab, uh, you can also basically figure it out the delta H for that reaction by just simply using a thermometer and water in this case. Any questions on that there? Yeah. So let's take a look at one that's sort of that situation. So why don't you give it a try? We have a 110 gram sample of a metal at 55 degrees Celsius, raises the temperature of 150 milliliters of water uh, from 25 degrees Celsius to 25.5. What is the specific heat capacity of the metal in this case? So give it a go, see what you come up with. Uh, so it's basically kind of the same idea. We got some water here and we got a piece of metal we're going to dump into the water. Uh, so in terms of the metal, uh, we know that the mass of it is 110 grams. Uh, we also know that the initial temperature is uh, 55.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, for the water here, uh, we have 150 milliliters of the water, which is a volume. We know hopefully that the density of water is one gram per milliliter which means if we times that by 150 milliliters, uh, we have for the mass of the water, 150 grams, right? Mm -hmm. We also have the initial temperature there of our water, uh, which is uh, 23 degrees Celsius. 
After the metal goes for a swim, our water rises in temperature to 25.5 degrees Celsius. We also know that the final temperature of the metal here should also end up at that exact temperature right after it goes for a swim. So we do know the final temperature here of our water should end up at 25.5. Uh, we are looking for the specific heat capacity here. And we always know liquid water specific heat capacity is 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So once again, when we look at water, we pretty much have everything we need to calculate in this case, how much energy the water should gain, right? As the metal is hotter than the water. So as it goes for a swim, the water should really pick up all that energy. So if we do that Q for the water here, uh, we got our MS Delta T gonna give us a uh, buck 50 here. 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Taking our final temperature, which is uh, 25.5 minus, I'll go underneath since I ran out of room, 23 degrees Celsius, big parentheses. Uh, that is going to give us here uh, 150 times 4.184 times our, looks like 25.5 minus 23. Going to get us uh, somewhere in the ballpark here of 1569 joules of energy, uh, probably a couple of sig figs based off of that subtraction there. So we'll go up to uh, 1600 joules on the rounding. That again is a positive value, which does make sense as the water is gaining all that energy from the metal that went for a swim. That also, though, allows us to figure out really how much energy that the metal lost, which should be the exact same number, except for the metal it is going to be exothermic as it's releasing that energy, which means our Q of our metal here will equal Q of the water. And you do need a negative in there somewhere. So our Q of our metal would end up being minus 1600 joules. Any questions on that so far? That really is, in this case, the last piece of information that we need to figure out our specific heat capacity of the metal. So once again, going back into our equation, but this time for the metal, solving for S one more time, which would be Q of the metal divided by M delta T. Put in our number here, which should be minus 1600 joules divided by our mass, uh, which was 110. And again, taking our final minus initial temperature. So that's going to be 25 minus 25.5 minus 55.5. And once again, that's going to generate the negative number that technically we need to turn this back into a positive. And that would get us uh, 1600 using the rounded number here. 110 divided by divided by 25.5 minus 55.5. And we'll go with a 0 0.48. Once again, none of the units here will cancel, so they all still remain joules per gram per degree Celsius. Any questions on transferring heat here from one object to the next? Here we use specific heat capacity uh, to our, we use the energy to find a specific heat capacity, but you could find other things like final temperatures of both the metal and the water, right? Uh, you could set these things equal to each other, which is what the other formula basically sewed. Ms delta T equals Ms delta T, one being water, one being the metal. The important part is somewhere you need to distribute that negative sign on one of them so that you have the right sort of math. Or you could do it kind of separately and then put them together, which also works maybe easier without misdistributing sometimes. I'm gonna say, I say you'd probably be okay. As long as you didn't give me like 400 numbers at the end or anything like that, no. Other questions? All right, questions on specific heat capacity. All right, so we talked a little bit about the idea there is a nutritional sort of calorie um, and that is a calorie with a capital C. And remember that uh, one of those kind of nutritional calories is actually one, thousand of the little calories, uh, which is also a kilocalorie. So typically when we're dealing with nutrition or like nutrition labels and those type of things,
Uh, we do use sort of nutritional calorie. A calorimeter, again, is an apparatus like we sort of talked about there uh, in a coffee cup form, but uh, this is how, you know, you can determine how much energy or calories there are in food, for example. Uh, this is what is sometimes referred to as a bomb calorimeter because it, it uh, kind of sets everything on fire. So you take your, I'm gonna go with a the cookie there inside. Uh, this is filled with oxygen. We have some ignition wires. We have a pretty isolated chamber uh, with a thermometer there to measure really the difference in the temperature of the water. And pretty much you ignite it. This guy catches on fire, starts to heat up obviously the water outside and you do a very simple calculation like we've been doing. And you can figure out the nutritional calories that would be associated uh, with your food object as it's burning. Uh, years ago, they used to do experiments where you ever would bring like a peanut or a Cheeto and a soda can with some water and you set the uh, food on fire underneath it. The water, the heat from the food burning heats the water in the can. And again, just following simply with a thermometer, basically the difference in the temperature of the water using your specific heat equation, you can figure out how many calories would be in your food. When we talk about food and sort of calories, there are what are sometimes referred to as caloric values. And there's three major groups. There are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Uh, carbs have a caloric value of four kilocalories per gram, which is basically four cal nutritional calories per gram. Uh, protein is also uh, four kilocalories per gram. And fat is nine kilocalories per gram. And if you ever look at a nutritional label, they usually will tell you how many grams of each of those things are on it. Uh, they will tell you how many grams of carbs there is, how many grams of protein, how many grams of fat. And if you just do that simple calculation of taking those numbers and multiplying by the caloric values and then adding all those values together, uh, that will basically give you your nutritional uh, calories for that particular food item, which is usually the number that you see on your nutritional label is how many calories there are per serving. In my experience, most of the time they do round down for some odd reason. Usually when they do that, <laughs> I'm not sure why that would be, I'm imagining, but uh, they do usually kind of round down. So again, just basically doing that and then really adding all the values together uh, is how you will get that. Obviously, uh, if you wanted to, if you knew how many calories you're burning swimming or whatever else you may be doing, you could figure out how much you need to do, which I don't know why you would want to do that, uh, to sort of burn off that food that you just ate. You shouldn't do that. You should just eat the food and enjoy it. All right. So when we do constant pressure calorimetry, um, again, this is what we're going to be doing uh, next week. And it's a very simple sort of experiment. Uh, instead of that fancy uh, calorimeter, which is the bomb calorimeter, uh, we do use just some coffee cups and uh, a thermometer. And we basically just measure, again, the change in the temperature of uh, the water, which will allow us to do those calculations. Uh, by the way, in the bomb calorimeter, sometimes calorimeter also has a sort of heat value associated with it, and you would add that in uh, sometimes uh, when you do a calculation with that. Oops. All right. So obviously here, if we had an ounce serving of oat bran, at 22 grams of carbs, 7 grams of fat, and 10 grams of protein, if we eat two servings, how many kilocalories did we obtain? So basically, we would just take each of these grams, which you typically could find on, again, a sort of label. We'll multiply it by its appropriate uh, caloric value, which in this case is four kilocalories per gram for carbs. We'll take our seven grams of fat and we'll multiply that by the nine kilocalories per gram. And we'll take our 10 grams of protein and multiply it by the four kilocalories per gram. Uh, that's going to be 88, I hope, without the aid of a calculator. And that is going to be, I'm going to go to my calculator now because it's been a long day, 9 times 7. There we'll go with an error. That's not good. 9 times 7. There it's going to go 63, I think is what it says. And uh, we got 40 there. At the end. So our total calories here would be 88 uh, plus 63 plus a 40. Uh, which give us about 191 kilocalories, uh, which is really nutritional calories. But since we did obviously eat two servings of this, I think it said, uh, we would multiply this by two 
and we ate there for breakfast about 382 kilocalories or nutritional calories there for breakfast, as they say, most important meal of the day, I suppose, right? Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> So uh, the last thing we're going to kind of talk about in this chapter is another way that we commonly can calculate the heat of a reaction uh, and the delta H. We talked about, uh, again, products minus reactants. Uh, we also talked about that you could have sort of a thermal equation where you could do kind of moles to energy type of one and use it as a conversion. Uh, a very common way that we also sometimes will calculate the energy for a reaction is what is sometimes referred to as Hess's law. And Hess's law is the idea that not all reactions occur pretty much in a one step sort of fashion. So as we've talked about before, when we have a reaction like A plus B goes to E plus F, this may not just occur in sort of a one move situation. It may actually be a result of several steps that occur, like A plus B goes to C plus D, C plus D then makes E plus F. And if we add these together, opposite of the arrows will cancel or reduce down. Everybody on the left-hand side of the arrow stays on the left-hand side. Everybody on the right-hand side stays on the right-hand side. So since energy is really a state function, and if you remember the picture of the hikers, one took the scenic route around the mountain, one went straight up. Uh, it really doesn't matter how you got there as long as it where you start and where you end. So if it happens to happen in multiple steps, maybe two reactions, three reactions, four reactions, however many reactions, uh, we can find the delta H for this reaction by simply taking each of these delta H's and adding them together. So we could take delta H1 plus delta H2. And that's what we see on the bottom here. Uh, we have the first reaction plus the second reaction. Here, the water in the gas phase basically cancels out, and we add up both of those steps to do so. Now, in a perfect situation, uh, maybe your reactions line up nice like it did here. You don't have to do much to them, but you sometimes do need to sort of manipulate reactions, kind of like what we had to do when we were doing K values and reactions. You sometimes maybe have to reverse a reaction, uh, you sometimes need to multiply by a common number, divide by a common number. So it does work a little bit different when we're dealing with delta H than it does with K. Uh, so for example, if you have this reaction and it has say a delta H value of 10 kilojoules, if you reverse this reaction and wanted it to look like this, uh, basically, our products became our reactants, our reactants became our products, and when you do products minus reactants and they switch, the sign switches. So instead of positive 10 kilojoules, this would then be negative 10 kilojoules. So again, it's different than what we do with K values here. If you reverse a reaction, the delta H value sign changes. So if it originally was positive, it becomes negative. And obviously, if it was originally negative, it would become positive. Other things that we could commonly do as well is sometimes we do need to multiply by a common number. So let's just say we needed two of the A. So we would multiply the entire equation there by two. And how that affects the delta H value is we would multiply the delta H value by two, which would give us 20 kilojoules. So again, that's a little bit different than what we do when we are dealing with equilibrium constants. Here we do multiply the delta H value. And lastly, we could divide, for example, everybody by a common number. So if we took this guy and divided everybody by two, that would take us back really to the original equation where we would take the delta H in this case and divide it by two, which would take us back to 10 kilojoules. So, when you're dealing Hess's law, it's very common that you do have to manipulate some of these equations. And again, you wanna keep track of what you did to the delta H value. And then at the end, you pretty much just wanna add them all together. Uh, so again, if you reverse reaction, you change the sign. If you multiply by a common number, you multiply delta H by a common number. And if you divide by a common number, you divide the delta H by a common number. <clears throat> 
Any questions on that? <clears throat> the goal here is really to build an equation you're looking for from other equations. The simplest approach to it is just to make sure everybody's on the correct side of the arrow. And when you make them on the correct side of the arrow, that you also have the right amount of everybody on the correct side of the arrow and adjust your delta H values. Let's take a look maybe at this one here. So this one uh, might not be too bad. We have our C is what we're looking for. So we're looking to figure out the delta H of this reaction. So right here, C is on the left and it is on the left in this case uh, and is one in each case. So I do not need to do really anything to this equation, which means since I didn't do anything to this equation, the delta H value will remain the same if I wrote it correctly. There we go. Uh, next thing that we want to look at is the CO2. And in this case, the CO2 happens to be on the correct side as well. So we don't really have to do much to this one either. And again, since I didn't do anything to the equation, we do keep it the same. That means when we add these together, opposites will cancel the arrows. And everybody on the left will stay there. It gives me C. That's a half and a half, which makes a whole. And that gives me CO2. That is the equation that we were looking for in this particular case. And because we didn't really do much to those delta H's, in this case, we all have to do is add them together. Minus 110 plus minus 283 gives us a delta H value of minus 393 kilojoules. That would mean in this particular case, this reaction is exothermic or endothermic. This reaction is exothermic because we have a negative value for delta H, right? <clears throat> Any questions on that one? So not much manipulation in that one. Let's take a look at one, hopefully, that you have to do something with. It looks like you might in this case. All right. So we're looking for the delta H of this reaction uh, based off of these reactions here. So see what you come up with. I imagine the right answer. Let's take a look. So really the best approach here is to take your desired equation and again, just move everybody to the correct side and make sure you have the right amount. So I would start with SO2 here. And the only equation that has SO2 is this one. And we do see SO2 is on the incorrect side for where we need it. It's on the product side. We need it on the reactant side. So we do know we need to reverse that first equation. So if we reverse the first equation, uh, that would put our SO2 over here on the left going to my S plus my O2. I also know because I reversed it here, the delta H should then change sign and become a positive 297 kilojoules. After I got my SO2 on the correct side, maybe since O2 is in both of them, I'll look at SO3. And SO3 is on the right-hand side, and that is where we find it in this equation. The difference, though, is we need to end up with only one of them, and in that equation, we have two, uh, which means we need to actually divide that bottom equation by two. So we would need to come back through here and divide everybody by two, and that would get us uh, S plus three halves O2 goes to SO3. And because I divided the equation by two, I will also need to divide my delta H by two as well. And that would give me basically minus 792 divided by two, gonna give me a negative 396. Any questions on that? There? <clears throat> well, I'm out of equation, so hopefully I put it together right. So we should, when we add this together, and cancel out what should be canceled out or reduced down what should be reduced down, uh, we should end up with our desired equation. So the S and the S will definitely cancel. I have 102 over here and three halves on that side leaves me a one half O2, right? One over one is the same as three over uh, sorry, it's a two over two, uh, which then three halves and two over two is one half, right? And that's everything that cancels out. That leaves us SO2 plus one half O2 gives me SO3. And that is the equation that we're looking for because we already changed all of our delta H values here. Uh, we simply just got to add those two together, obviously keeping the signs the way they are. 
the 297 plus minus 396 is going to give me a minus 99 kilojoules, which is on the list. So that's good. So it should be that one here. This reaction would also be a exothermic reaction as we have a negative for our delta H. Any questions on that one there? Yeah. So Hess's law could be like this, two equations, could be three or four equations that you have to put together, but really just kind of go uh, kind of piece by piece and keep it really simple. Sometimes people overcomplicate it. I uh, just want to get everybody on the correct side of the arrow and the right amounts. And usually other things will sort of fall into place as you kind of move everybody uh, from one side to the next, like the O2s fell into place and also the sulfurs in this case, right, kind of fell into place as we were manipulating them. Any questions on Hess's law here? <clears throat> okay. So just to finish up here on this chapter, heat, as we've been talking about, is really the flow of energy due to an energy difference. Uh, we can also calculate sometimes the internal change in energy, which is delta E, and that is the heat, which is Q, like our specific heat sort of equation, and the uh, plus the work uh, done, which is W. Uh, work can also work just like heat, it could either be done on a system or the system can do work on something else. By convention, kind of the same idea. Uh, if we have a positive value uh, for E, heat and work is added to the system and it is removed when we have sort of a negative value like it's being given off from the system to the surroundings. And as we talked about, energy is a driving force. Uh, most processes that occur spontaneously involve uh, energy being given off. And as we'll talk about, exothermic does help with uh, a reaction being spon uh, spontaneous. Doesn't necessarily guarantee that the reaction will be spontaneous, uh, but it does sort of help. Um, and again, as we talked about that flow of high to low temperature. Any questions on this chapter here? <clears throat> All right, then we will go off to the uh, next chapter in just a second here to find it. So now we're gonna go, uh, Okay, so, uh, so uh, 16 is about entropy, free energy, which is Gibbs free energy and equilibrium because we cannot forget about equilibrium. Uh, so this is really all the rest of the th thermodynamics uh, that we will cover here. Uh, we also get to use some other letters of the alphabet. Entropy is delta S, <laughs> Gibbs free energy is delta G. And of course our favorite letter is K in this case. Uh, we'll talk about equilibrium in this particular case as well. So let's talk a little about sort of entropy first and really the idea of spontaneous processes. Now, it's really important when we talk about a process being spontaneous, and we might've mentioned it before, when we talk about a reaction being spontaneous, it really has uh, nothing to do with how fast or slow that reaction occurs. Sometimes people think the reaction is spontaneous, so you snap your fingers and it's going to happen really, really fast. There's lots of reactions that are spontaneous that happen super slow, and that's why we add catalysts sometimes to them to help them out, um, but there's some that happen really fast. But the idea of spontaneous just simply means that under those particular conditions, pretty much if you leave it, it will happen pretty much. That reaction will take place. Again, it could take place really fast. It could take place really slow. Uh, but it should happen. There are several physical and chemical processes that we know that are spontaneous. Uh, waterfall runs downhill, right? Usually the water doesn't go up, it does go down. Uh, we take some sugar and a cup of coffee, it will dissolve. Uh, we know that the zero degree Celsius is both where water will freeze and melt. As we've been talking about with the energy chapter, heat will flow from the hotter object to the colder. Uh, iron exposed to oxygen will form rust and obviously our skiers here going downhill spontaneous right you just need to go over the hill and come on down going upwards is non-spontaneous right you have to apply some external sort of force i think to get yourself back up the hill why you are scaring this person very much as you're coming up as they're coming down is probably not what you want to see i imagine uh, but that is obviously a non-spontaneous process versus a spontaneous process some other sort of examples of that, if we have sort of gases kind of confined to one chamber, can't really see it, maybe on your notes you can, there is actually a little um, open shut type valve right there. If we open the valve, 
those gas molecules will spontaneously start to flow into the other side of the container that's there. And as you can see, you'll get gas molecules on the other side. If you have gas on both sides of this sort of container, uh, they really won't usually by themselves decide, hey, let's just all go over there. You might be able to convince them over there by doing something, but it wouldn't be sort of a spontaneous event that everybody would come on vacation there on the left-hand side uh, by itself. So that begs the question of, does a decrease in enthalpy mean a reaction uh, will proceed spontaneously? Remember, enthalpy is what we've been talking about in the last chapter. That is our delta H, which if we have a negative number, again, is exothermic heat and energy being released. And if we have a positive number, it is endothermic heat and energy being absorbed. So these are all spontaneous processes. And you can see some of them are exothermic and some of them are endothermic, but they all do occur spontaneously. Uh, that's basically methane, a little sparking. You get your combustion reaction occurring. Uh, the formation of water there uh, from an acid and base is a negative sort of process. The melting of ice into liquid water is spontaneous. If we take an ice cube out of the freezer, right, just spontaneously, it's going to pick up the heat from the air and it will start to melt, right? Regardless if you did anything to it or not, it will just spontaneously pick that up. Uh, the dissolving and making of a solution, which is the bottom one there, also an endothermic uh, type of process. So clearly, as you can see here from these examples, we can have both endothermic processes and exothermic processes, which are both spontaneous. So clearly delta H is not really our sort of value that we want to look at to help us decide whether or not a reaction will be spontaneous. Um, as we will see, exothermic reactions do favor a reaction being spont uh, spontaneous, uh, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee it as we can kind of see with the bottom two there that you could definitely have endothermic reactions that are spontaneous. So the other sort of factor or one of the other factors that we can kind of look at to help us decide whether or not a reaction will be spontaneous or not, uh, one is what is referred to as entropy, not to be confused with enthalpy that we just talked about. Entropy is S and more specifically, we use Delta S, which is the change in entropy. And it is a measure of randomness or disorder in a system. Entropy works a little bit different than you might sort of envision. And what I mean by that is as the order increases, uh, the entropy value decreases and becomes actually more negative. And as the amount of disorder uh, basically increases, we typically will see a more positive value for entropy. Uh, so the change in entropy kind of works a little bit different than sort of how we visualize after enthalpy, the negative stories like negative exothermic things happening. Uh, so it's sort of a little bit opposite in that sense. Um, if our final state minus our initial state is one way that you could calculate the change in entropy, you can look up those values in the thermodynamic table right next to the delta H values and the delta G values. You'll be able to find them in there and you could actually calculate it. So if the change from the initial to the final state increases the randomness, uh, we will see the delta S value become more positive. And you should maybe think about it one, two, one way, I guess, either think about it as either increasing or decreasing the order or increasing or decreasing the disorder, whichever way you want to do it. You might not want to keep bouncing back from order and disorder, it might confuse you. So maybe pick one and kind of stick with it. Uh, the most common place where we could see a lot of the change in entropy uh, is as we change phases. So as we go from the solid state, in the solid state, things are usually together pretty ordered, right? They're not moving around a lot, right? They're pretty uh, rigid. They're packed in there pretty tight to one another. So there's a lot of order, especially, for example, if you have an ionic solid, right? There's long range order as to how they come together. When you go to the liquid phase, right, things have a little bit more energy, right? So they're moving around a little bit more. They're able to pass each other, right? Which is why liquids are fluid. So there's increasing the amount of disorder that's going to happen in that situation. And clearly when we get to the gas phase, there is a lot of disorder, right? If you just think about it, gas phase, everybody's broken apart. They're flying around, moving around, right? Craziness happening. 
Uh, so we do see a big increase in the entropy as we go from liquid to gas as they're moving around. Obviously, they also have a lot more energy usually at that point uh, as well. So as we look at this particular one here, where we take water in the solid phase, which is ice, and we go to liquid, we should think for an increase in the amount of disorder. And we should also then be that the uh, change in entropy should increase and actually should become more positive in this case. So a positive change in entropy, meaning disorders increasing, a negative change in entropy means that uh, disorder is decreasing. There's a lot more order happening. The other major difference as well, as we'll talk about, and we'll see it in just a second, but uh, delta S in terms of units are typically joules, while delta H is typically kilojoules. And we'll see some equations where both of these values are used together. And you do want to be really careful as you're kind of using these values together that you're not off by a factor of a thousand. So you got to get everybody usually into the same units, especially if you are uh, using them in the same equation. So disorder is related to probability and a probable event is basically uh, <clears throat> one in where there are many ways that it could happen. Right, an improbable event is one where there's really only a few ways to do it. If you have an order state, there's a low probability of, of it occurring and it has a small entropy. In order to do something correctly, right, there's only a few ways to do it, right? But there's a greater chance that you will screw up along the way, right, perhaps. A lot more ways where you can mess up something, so there's a greater chance that that would occur. A disordered state has a higher probability of occurring. Again, like if we needed to leave this room, there are multiple doors that we could exit out of this room. So it is very probable that we would get out of this room through one of these, I wanna say there's like four doors in this place, I think, believe it or not. In case you've never noticed, there are four doors. There are two in the back. <laughs> Your emergency exits are this way and this way, please exit or orderly here. And there's another door in the front. All right. Thank you for flying with us. All right, so uh, the disordered state, uh, if we had a room where there's only one way out, right? And it's blocked and all the windows are blocked, probably not going to make it out of the room. These are cheerful thoughts we think about here today at uh, this evening. So when we think about probability, there is an actual equation, which sometimes referred to as the Boltzmann equation uh, that deals with this. And that is S, which is the entropy. K is the Boltzmann constant, which is this guy on the bottom. And the natural log of W, W is what is referred to as microstates. And microstates are really sort of a, the number of ways you could sort of achieve something or accomplish something. And if we're looking at the example here, uh, we basically have four circles. And if we wanna put the four circles on all on one side, uh, there's really only one way to do that. You're just going on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, which is the same thing. If we want three circles on one side and one on the other, there's four different ways of doing that. And if we want two circles on each side, there are six different ways to do that. If we just simply look at the Boltzmann equation here, and we just look at, say, the natural log of one. When you take the natural log of one, what do you get? Natural log of one is zero, yes, which means our entropy value here will be zero, basically pretty low entropy, right? So not a very high entropy, not a very probable sort of event. If we did the natural log of six in this equation here, and you put that onto your calculator there, natural log of six is about 1.79, which obviously would give you a much more positive number, right? A higher entropy value and clearly, if this was like a game at the carnival, right? Better odds of trying just to get two basketballs on one side, right? Versus all four of them on one side, right? So a much higher probability of happening that, assuming that none of the games are rigged, right? And the balls actually do fit into the holes, right? I know they, they would never do that, I'm sure, or under to inflate the balls or over inflate the balls so they bounce out, right? Or anything like that. All right. These are life lessons, and let's stop with the life lessons now and go on to the day before I say something I shouldn't. 